Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. So we begin a new series today entitled Inked uh, by God. I mean, I am pumped about this whole series because basically we're going to have individuals uh, for the next five weeks come and share their story of how God has just stamped his approval upon their life. Every single one of us who are following Jesus, we've been inked by the Lord himself. Amen. There's a reason, there's a purpose, there's a a divine expression that he wants to use us uh, so that we can make a difference in our world today. And so, you know, we didn't get uh, some good reviews. I think we put that trailer on our social media and we got some negative comments and bad reviews and saying that, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You can't have tattoos. He don't know his theology and all this kind of stuff. I didn't read any of them. That's what somebody told me. And uh, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm in good company because Jesus was also ridiculed and he was all, you know, messed up anyways. Right. But and I'm not in just to be clear, I'm not endorsing tattoos. Um, Although we have a a tattoo artist right outside uh, across the bridge. Uh, And I am not asking you to remove your tattoos. I've got one on my own. Uh, And I, I do. I don't have a degree in theology either, but I have gone to Bible school. And I have studied pastoral ministries, but that's not what validates my calling and my gifting. It's not a document or a letter of recommendation. It's not any of those things. It's not a diploma or a plaque that I have on the wall, even though I've got all that. But that's not what validates the ministry. It's the spirit of God that validates us. Amen. When Jesus Christ sent his disciples into the world to go preach the gospel, he didn't give them a certificate of endorsement. He didn't give them a degree or a diploma. He didn't even give them a Bible. All he gave them was something that's called a commandment to love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. And then he inked them by his spirit. He empowered them by the spirit of God to go out there and proclaim uh, his name throughout all the earth. And so that's the big idea behind um, Inked by God, is we're going to hear different stories. This morning, we're going to hear a fantastic story uh, from my wife, and she's going to tell our story, but from her perspective. So it's a little bit different when I share it from my perspective, but hers is just a different view, a different angle. We've got some folks that are coming from, um, they are actually live in Austin, but they used to work for the president up in Washington. Um, Dave, they were actually a part when, when the 9-11, they got hit the, the Pentagon. David was in, David Contreras is going to be speaking on one of those times. And then we have Rebecca Contreras, his wife, who's going to be speaking uh, next month on the first Sunday of the month. And that lady's got a crazy testimony of how God just redeemed her life from destruction. She went from the crack house to the White House. And so she's going to share her story. You got Pastor Joel, Pastor Jeremiah that are also going to be sharing their story. You know, sometimes in life, there's a defining moment when all of a sudden, man, it's like I've been inked by the Lord himself. And he put a stamp of approval. And we just know that we're, we're called to go do this uh, testimony like Dan and testimony like ourselves. But most of the time, you just kind of figure it out. You kind of walk your way through this thing. It's like, oh. This is, this is what the Lord wants. You'll hear Pastor jo- uh, Joel next week. And so it's not, it might not be like, oh, I, was, I, I didn't have any drugs. Most of these guys have been worshiping God as a young child, which is awesome. That's what my testimony, that's what my girl's testimony is. But so I'm excited about it. But this morning, um, what I want to do is I want to introduce my wife because she is going to come up here and share our story um, from her perspective. You can come on up, babe. You ready? (laughs) She did a fantastic job this morning. Ezekiel says it this way. Ezekiel said that he would put a new spirit and a new heart on the inside of you. One that would transform your life so that all of a sudden you'd want to obey God. You'd want to serve him. You want to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. When Jesus comes back, the scripture says in Revelations that he will have um, a mark on his thigh that says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, you can't tell me that's not a tattoo on his thigh. (laughs) I mean, it's like it's branded on his thigh. I'm not saying he's got a tattoo. I'm just saying it says that he's got a a name on his thigh. It says King of Kings. And it's not so much to um, for us for, for him to remind you of who he is. It's for us to be reminded of who he is. Amen. Amen. 
because that is the one who's marked you. That's the one who has the power to, for you to help you overcome anything that comes your way. So, babe, love you. The Lord bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> amen. Thank you for that endorsement. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I'm a paper girl, which I brought, but I skipped some of my notes this morning. So my husband was like, what if I put it at 20 font? Will you be able to see it then? <laughs> So I'm at 24 font. <laughs> uh, good morning. It's so good to have y'all guys here this morning in the house of the Lord. It's, I mean, there's no other place that I would rather be on a Sunday morning, honestly, than to be here with a bunch of you guys today. And so um, I, I want to just share my story like Pastor Marcus said, and I'll start with this intro. Um, it's found in 2 Corinthians 2, 14. And it says, now thanks be to God who has always led us into triumph in Christ. And through our yielded lives, he spreads the fragrance and the knowledge of God everywhere we go. Do you really need letters of recommendation to validate our ministry like others do? For your very lives are letters of recommendation, praise God, permanently engraved on our hearts, recognized and read by everybody. As a result of our ministry, you are living letters you are living letters written by Christ, not with ink chiseled on tablets of stone, but inked by God's spirit on the tablets of tender hearts, and then we publish it. So that's what's amazing about the Lord is that your living life is a testimony inked for all to see. And so um, I'll go back again. My name is Natalie Avalos. I'm one of the co-pastors here at Crossroads Church. And then I love this name that a little girl gave me when she was eight years old. She was here at the church. Now she's grown, like, I think she's 20 years old. Um, she used to call me the director of everything because I told her one day, I said, what do you think I am? And she was walking with me everywhere. And back in the day when we first started the church, um, 15 years ago, we were mobile. So we were in a box truck. And we had everything, including children's church. I mean everything in this big truck. And a lot of the children would come early. One of the guys just left earlier. He's 21 now, Chris Contreras. And these kids used to follow me and say, Miss Natalie, how can I help you? How can I help you? And I'm like, we got to put up this canvas. We got to do this. We got to do that. And she saw, then I'd go greet, and then I'd do blah, blah, blah. And then she said, you know what? You're the director of everything. And then I thought that was cute, so I'm a doe. D-O-E, director of everything. <laughs> but my most important role here, I believe, hey, Josh, it's good to see y'all's family this morning. My most important role here, I believe, is to be pastor's wife. Amen. That's my most important role. Yeah. Take care of this man and keep him out of trouble. So when my husband asked me to speak on Labor Day, I thought, how appropriate to speak on Labor Day because I don't know how many of y'all know what Labor Day celebrated about, but it's about celebrating American workers who helped us to be America. And uh, they worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Finally, a president later down the road recognized in 1894, hey man, I wanna celebrate these people who are making our country great. And I believe that with us knowing who we are in Christ, we will continue that trend of why we celebrate Labor Day is because we know how to give God the glory for the gifts that he's given us, the skills that he's given us to make America what it is today. So that's my little deal for that because I know God loves America. Um, and so what I love about, thank you for having me speak, is that the gifts that people have, the gifts that you have sitting in here, y'all are incredible gifts. I wish I could open each one of y'all, but I know a lot of y'all's gifts. Unfortunately, the natural gift that we have sometimes because life comes and punches us in the gut or slaps us in the face, we don't even get to walk in it for a long time. And that was part of my story. One of my gifts I feel like is I'm an encourager. I'm an encourager because God encouraged me when I was at the very bottom of the barrel in my life at a very young age. So I'll start with this. When I was 12 years old, um, my parents got a divorce and I um, felt super, super, super lost. And I thank God every day that 
he knew one day that I would turn my face to him and live out how he had called me to live out my life. So one of the scriptures that I really love in life that has helped me so many times to remember what my God has done for me is in Psalms 139, 14. And it reads like this. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works, Lord, are wonderful. And in this passage, uh, the psalmist David, he's praising God because he's overwhelmed by God's majesty and goodness in his life to create him in a unique way. And I don't know if you guys know this, but you guys are all created in a unique way, fashion informed, with him thinking about every single thing about even the hair on your head. And for some of us, that's getting thinner and thinner. <laughs> but he knows, he knows, he's counting it. And so um, I was like marveled when I found out all these beautiful things about what God had for me. So this is the only one text that shows us where we're inked by God and how our story can give him glory. So my story like yours is still being written but I had several women who were skillfully positioned by God in my life at an early age. And my story couldn't, it could have gone different, you guys. Honestly, my story could have been written behind prison walls. I'm just being honest. When I get to certain parts today, I just want to warn you ahead of time. I get super emotional about some things because it's very real to me. And we used to have an instructor in Bible school. He said, if it's not real, if it's, if it's old to you, then it's not real to you. And my salvation story is not old to me. It's still very real to me. And I pray yours is too. So um, here's how it went. Many of you may or may not know, but several years before we knew Christ, Pastor Marcus and I had lived a life of drugs, domestic abuse, abuse of drugs, hate, fear, and an illegal lifestyle. For me, it started at an innocent age of 12 years old. My parents divorced, they parted ways, and they abandoned my brothers and myself. We were forced to leave our family home and were dropped off at my grandmother's. So life got bad for me real quick at age 12. In my anger and hurt, I turned to one of my uncles for friendship and mentoring only to become a mule for passing drugs from one person to another. I look back now and I thank God that he protected me in that season where a lot of my physical innocence was spared from all that evil. But my mental state of anger, hatred, and lack of trust for anyone was damaged beyond repair. Think about that. At age 12, I was already like, I don't trust you. I don't believe you. I don't care about you. I hate you. Um, at age 12. Then I met a guy, really, who was a boy that seemed, so, <laughs> that seemed so sweet and thoughtful. And at age 13, Pastor Marcus came into my life. At the time, he was known as Mark or Sweet A. Sweet A, sweet a by his athletic friends. <laughs> so I was not an athlete, but I was very good at running, which later became a part of my healing and my story. For me, this guy became a glimpse of hope to my heart that maybe I could be better because I thought he was good. Well, how many of you know that bad company can corrupt even the best of who we are? In fact, there's a scripture, young people, that prove that. 1 Corinthians 15, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. So when pastor said he was a good boy, he said that so many times when he shares his story. He's like, but I was a good boy. So when pastor said he was a good boy before he met me, that's partly true. It was not long after that that we were together and that my uncle introduced my boyfriend to the evils of drugs and corruption. And all was, that was all the stuff I was trying to get away from. All of a sudden, he sucked into that with me. By age 15, we were already on a downward spiral to hell and in a hurry to get there. At age 16, I'm pregnant. I hate my life, I hate myself, and I hate the person that I'm with.
I told myself it was going to be better for the second service, but by age 18, my life got worse. We became suppliers, and my now husband is an abusive junkie. But there was a lady that lived upstairs. We lived in government housing on Seguin Manor, on 123 Seguin Manor. It's still here. It's so pretty now. Back then it wasn't, but it's pretty now. Um, she lived upstairs, and we had paper-thin walls so she could hear the screams, the violence, and occasionally she witnessed the physical fights that we would have. I'm sure what she felt for me was pity. But she began to visit me that day, and she brought her watchtower literature with her. And even though I could never buy into her thoughts about God, it was just nice to feel that someone cared about me. Little did I know that someone had always cared about me. I was inked by prayer and the promises of God as a child. At that moment, I was in the dark, and my mind was the playground of the enemy. You know, in life, we choose what marks engrave us and what marks engrave our minds. Pastor Marcus often says, it's not what happens to you as a child that destroys you, it's the lies you believed when it happened to you. Isn't that true? Yeah. At times we believe the stroke of our enemy's ink is more powerful than the eternal stroke of our God. The ink that screams, you're not enough, you're a failure, nobody wants you or loves you. What's even more sad about all that and what makes me so mad is that when you believe those lies around you, you let that ink identify you. So they begin to, people around you begin to treat you according to the marks that you show them and that we've taken on ourselves. The artist that you're showing is not the artist of the living God, but the God of this world, Satan. He's the author of confusion, hate, and anger. But here is a good reminder that we have a God that is, has the power to erase the marks that the enemy has tried to leave Amen. on you and me. Amen. Amen. The Bible says we are God's handiwork in Ephesians 2.10 and Isaiah 43.7. The work of his hand and created for the display of his splendor. So back to my story. The Lord God himself had a plan for me bigger than I could ever imagine or fathom. Isaiah 49, 16 through 17 says, Behold, I have graven, inscribed, inked you upon the palms of my hands. So when you see God's arms stretched out on those pictures that you see, think about it. When his hands are stretched out, you're inked on the palm of his hands. So one day after having my second child in 1985, I finally cracked a book open that was called The Romans Road. I don't know if y'all have ever seen one of those Bibles. The Baptists used to give them out a lot. They're so good at leading people to salvation. And um, there was a scripture in there that came alive to me. It was Re Revelation 3.20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come and eat with him and he with me. I heard God's voice that day when I read that scripture loud and clear. Like I literally audibly heard his voice and I got so scared, I just closed that book. <laughs> it scared me because I heard him say, if you just, just knock, I'm gonna let you in. So suddenly there really did come a door knocking and it was the lady who was upstairs. It was my neighbor. So I was kind of thinking, you know, trying to put to, you know how the enemy does that? I could have like totally went into a false religion if I said, oh, this scripture says this, and now this person's knocking. It must be God. But because God had inked my life and purpose, I didn't fall for that. So she came and she wanted to spend some time with me and she could introduce me to her religion, she said. Well, that day I was at a crossroads in my life with the decision to either follow her religion or remain the same in my pitiful life. So later that day, I made a choice to throw up a desperate prayer, just a desperate prayer, and I said, God, if you're real, you'll change my life. 
And the reason I said that was because I grew up with a mom who, she used to say she was an atheist, but now I believe she was agnostic. Um, and ever since I was a little kid, I, I used to see the people knock on the door and they had all these pamphlets with, you know, uh, Adam and Eve and it was so colorful and I just wanted to talk and know what, what, are they, what do they have? I want that. And my mom would say crazy stuff like, you know what God is? God could be anything. He could be that tree right there. I was like, wow, really? And then she's like, and you know what? The Bible could be anything. It could be that comic book right there. I'm like, wow. So my mom was into New Age before New Age was a thing. <laughs> And uh, she was kind of crazy, but thankfully, mom, in the end of her life, uh, I got to lead her to the Lord, and she said yes to Jesus. So I'll get to see her again. But so the rest is history. A few weeks later, after the lady knocked along the door with the chief elders of the church, I had tricked Marcus into a Bible study. <laughs> And then not just tricked him, but if you guys are uh, married, you know about this one. I threatened him <laughs> that I would convert to her religion. And him, as a non-practicing Catholic, said, you can't do that. You're going to betray my religion. And my thought was, you know what? Your religion, your God is a needle, and your religion is drugs. I didn't say that. I didn't use my mouth that day, but I thought it. I was like, because I didn't want to get, you know. So anyway, so not to fight, I begged for him to meet these people. And the knock on the door came that day, March 1984. It was on a Saturday morning because that's when they usually, you know, do their thing. And the scene was set. But to my despair, I walked in the kitchen just to find him with 80 cc's and a needle ready to go in the kitchen. And I knew that it probably had crank in it, which for those of you who are old dudes, y'all know what that is. It's basically meth. And I don't know why they called it that back then, but they did. And uh, he was ready to put the needle in his arm. So remember, I wasn't a Christian. What did I do? In true old Natalie fashion, which I see that little gal every now and then, I grabbed a broom and I started trying to knock it out of his arm. <laughs> I was like, you're going to stay clean just to hear them. So I tried to knock it out of his arm. Of course, he won. My heart was broken that day again, but I pushed through the hurt. I pushed through the hurt, waited for him to do all that, opened up our seven locks that we had on our door, and I invited them in. So my so-called Catholic husband grabs a dusty old Catholic Bible out of the closet with Mary holding Jesus on the cover. Part of me was so mortified because in those two closets, in that if anybody's ever lived in Seguin Manor, you know what I'm talking about, in, so, in the two bedrooms, they have two closets as soon as you walk in through the door. And our closets used to be full with garbage bags of weed all the way to the top, lots of garbage bags of weed. And then we had other stuff that needed to stay cold in the refrigerator. We had lots of stuff. I was telling this brother earlier, I said, you know, we had everything. We had lots of everything, but we had nothing is we thought we had everything, but the everything that we had was absolutely nothing. And um, so anyway, he pulled out that old Catholic Bible from there, and I thought to myself, this guy is higher than a kite. He'll be fueled to go for at least a few days. But to my amazement, he actually listened to them, and he even opened the Bible, and I couldn't believe it. Then the miracle happened. They asked him to turn to a scripture reading, and he did. Suddenly, his face looked up at me with a strange look, and the coloring in his jaundiced skin began to change. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have ever known any drug addicts, um, but they have this skin color that's kind of a grayish, it's, and they have, they have no smile, no anger. It's like everything is just, it, there's no life. It's like they're a zombie. It's, it's, it's horrible, it's horrible, it's horrible life. And, um, but all of a sudden he's there and I could see coloring. And he jumps up, closes the Bible and he walks out of the room. So my heart, I'm sitting and I, I didn't even tell y'all this, but when they came in, I sat on the couch with them and then he sat over there. It's like, it's us against you, <laughs> you know, you gotta make a decision. And, um, so anyway, he, um, 
He got up and walked out of the room. My heart sank for a moment. Then fear set in because the lady saw my face. She said, you know what, we'll come back another time. And why fear set in is because we really did used to knock down, drag out, right? It was bad. And so fear and disappointment struck my heart again, but I knew, I knew how to gear up for war in my home. So I would tuck my hair. I used to have long hair that was way past my waist. I'd grab my hair, do it like this, twirl it, put it in my shirt, because then he didn't have anything to go for. And uh, that's crazy to talk like that, but it's, it's so true. If you see episodes of Cops, that was our life. And um, in this book, I tucked, so I tucked in my hair, quietly walked down the, the hall door, and there was no Marcus. Then I slowly cracked the bedroom door and could only see the back of him lying across the bed, and the bed was shaking. So the first thought I had when I saw his skin color change was he was ODing. And that's why he walked out of the room, or it was just so powerful he wanted. Then when I saw the bed shaking, I'm like, he must really be ODing, because you know you go into seizures and stuff. And um, now when you're shaking your head and agreeing with me, I know you know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> but it's okay because we're all inked by God. And um, <clears throat> so, anyways, he was the bed was shaking. I thought, oh man, he's overdosing. But his face looked up at me with tears streaming down his face, and he said. I have to change. We have to change. Whatever is in this book, we need. So today I want to encourage you to write your story to give him glory. Find your gifts that he's inked you with. Quit looking at your past failures, patting yourself on your back for your personal man-made victories. Learn to live your life without fear, shame, pride, and perversion. I encourage every man, woman, and child to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and live for him. Some of you may have noticed that I have been missing in the first services here at church, but what you may not know is that I've been teaching in children's church. I want to give those kids the same chance God gave me. I'm praying for them, encouraging them to follow God and live for him. Our Father in heaven cares. He loves so prayerfully. I implore you to consider serving in the children's ministry area here because we aren't just babysitting in there, y'all. We're inking them with hope and love for their future. We want them to write their story to give him glory. Hebrews 12, 2 says this, remember that God is the author and finisher of our faith. So here's the take home for you today. I hope you do sign up to help with us in children's church so we can empower our kids with permanent ink. Why should we let the world tell our kids what they're supposed to be? Why can't we bring them to church and tell them what they're supposed to be? Tell our kids what they're supposed to be. Permanently ink them with God's word. Second thing I'd like for you to do is grab a journal and begin to write two things, one in blank, black ink, Write down the lies that you've believed about yourself from time to time. And then second thing, in red ink, write down the truth of who God says you are. If I can ask you to write down what comes to mind when you think about God, I can almost predict your future and what artist you represent. We've all been inked by someone you and I are a byproduct of God's picture inked inside. Revelations 19, 15 says this about Jesus. One on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written. And the name he has written is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes. It's a permanent reminder for us, not for him, but to remember who it is that made us. We are his handiwork, created for his splendor and his glory. Amen. Amen. Ask my husband to come up. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.